بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the ISOC, the Imperial ISOC, for inviting me here to speak today. This is the first time I've actually spoken um, at Imperial, and hopefully, with optimism, inshallah, this will be one of many other, many other visits, inshallah ta'ala, to, to the ISOC. Brothers and sisters, our Islamic tradition teaches us that this life is a life of bala, it's a life of tests, it's a life of tribulations. Whereas the afterlife is meant to be a life of recompense and reward. And so this is why the scholars would traditionally consider the dunya to be Darul Bala, the abode of tribulations, and the akhirah to be the Dar Al Jaza, the abode of recompense. And this is one of the meanings of Yawmuddin, the day of recompense, where everyone will be repaid back for what they did in this life. So when we understand life in this manner, we realize that we shouldn't expect the recompense of our good deeds just to come in this life. There is more to come in terms of reward, in terms of comfort, in terms of happiness in the afterlife. So if you think that this life is just about attaining happiness just in this life, then we've really misunderstood the reality of this existence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he in many places in the Quran, as well as in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, stresses the reality that uh, this life is about toiling, it's about working hard in order to reap the fruits in the afterlife. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayuhal insan, innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadahan famulaqi. That, O oh mankind, indeed you are toiling towards your Lord. Everyone is working hard and they will eventually meet him or meaning Allah or eventually meet the end or the recompense of their deeds. This is the reality of life. And even when the people of paradise, they enter into paradise, if you look at the statements, and this is a fascinating thing to study, the statements of the people of paradise, once they eventually enter into paradise, what will they say? Um, one of the things that they will say, what Allah reports in the Quran, mentions in the Quran, وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ They will say, all praises due to Allah. Alhamdulillah الذي أذهب عنا الحزن All praises due to Allah who removed from us a grief and sadness. Indicating that even the people of Jannah, they would have suffered somewhat in their lives. That they would have gone through hardship. But that hardship and that sadness and, that tri and those tribulations that they suffered didn't prevent them from progressing in life, in achieving things, in becoming great people. And so, and that's what we find. If we look to the biographies and the lives of the great people that walked upon this earth, from the prophets and from the righteous people and the scholars and the worshippers and the, the ascetics, etc., we find that they lived a life of, of hardship, actually. But despite that hardship, we find that they were very optimistic. And they were never pessimistic in their, outlook, in, their, in their outlook towards life. And that's a very important point we need to understand and appreciate. So these challenges that we face in life, these challenges that we face in life, how do we face these challenges? What principles should we have in our mind? What should our attitudes be towards hardships and tribulations, whether it be in your university life or in your, lives to, in your future lives to come? Without a shadow of a doubt, optimism, being optimistic in our outlook, is one of the methods in which we deal with these challenges. And so we have this concept in our religion known as, as fa'al or tafa'ul. Tafa'ul, as, as it said that the Prophet used to say, يُعْجِبُنِي الْفَأْلُ That al-fa'al or optimism, or to be optimistic, is something which, uh, which, I'm, which I really like. It's something which I'm really pleased with. And we will look at examples from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam how he was really optimistic, extremely optimistic. Even in the most you know, difficult moments in his life, we find that he had this really optimistic nature. 
We also have in our religion other concepts such as hope or raja. Having hope in the mercy of Allah, having hope in the assistance of Allah, having hope that He will forgive us and aid us and assist us. We also have the concept of husnul dhan, having good thoughts about Allah. Husnul dhan, having good thoughts about of Allah, which actually plays a fundamental role in the life of the believer, or it should play the fund- a fundamental role in the life of a believer. We also have the concept of tawakkul, reliance upon Allah, which forms a massive part of our, in, in, in terms of actions of the heart, it plays a massive role in, in our actions of the heart with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of these concepts, tafa'ul, optimism, we have uh, raja, hope, husn dhan, having good thoughts about Allah, and tawakkul, uh, reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You find all of these concepts mentioned in the books of Islamic spirituality, in otherwise known as suluk or behavior. And scholars have spent you know, centuries discussing the finer details of, of these points. And they all really essentially revolve around this concept of being optimistic in our outlook. Being optimistic has its benefits. It pushes a person to, uh, to do good actions in one's religion. It, it pushes a person to be progressive in their own personal development. And by being optimistic, we are able to overcome trials and tribulations that we face in life. A concept that um, Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, one of the great scholars of, of, of Islam, known as Tabib al-Qalb, the doctor of the heart, meaning the doctor of the spiritual heart, um, he spoke about uh, Ar-Raja in some detail in his book, Madarij al-Salikin. And uh, this is one of my favorite chapters, in fact, from, from this book, Ar-Raja, the, the chapter of hope. And he explained uh, hope in, in, in a fascinating way. He said that hope, what is hope? What is, what's the essence of hope? We're having good thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He described it as being a state of irtiyah. A state of irtiyah. And irtiyah, you can translate as being in a state of comfort. Being in a state of comfort uh, or being in a relaxed mood whilst waiting for something which is beloved to you. This is hope. So you're not anxious. You're not in a state of you know, anxiety and worry and distress. You're in a relaxed mood. Waiting for something which is beloved to you. This is irtiyah. You're waiting for that goodness to come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Peace of mind, tranquility. And he described having or being in this state of hope being an absolute necessity for the life of the salik or the one who wants to traverse a spiritual path. He says, فَالرَّجَاءُ ضُرُورِيٌّ لِلْمُرِيدِ السَّالِكِ That this station of hope, it's an absolute necessity for this person who wishes to traverse the spiritual path. Likewise, the Arif, the, uh, the, the Gnostic. And he says, لَوْ فَارَقَهُ لَحْفَظًا لَتَلِفَ أَوْكَادْ That if this person was to abandon hope for one moment, he will be destroyed. He will be destroyed, or he will be, you know, about to be destroyed. Why? And he explains. He says, فَإِنَّهُ دَائِرٌ بَيْنَ ذَنْبٍ يَرْجُ غُفْرَانَهُ Because every person is essentially, he's in a position where he's in a state of sin. And so he hopes for his sins to be forgiven. وَعَيْبٍ يَرْجُ إِصْلَاحَهُ Or he has a fault with himself in terms of his character, Okay, his behavior, he has an aib. And so he's in a state of hope, hoping that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reform his character and behavior. Or he has a good deed that he hopes that Allah will accept. Or he, uh, or he's, he, he's in a state of steadfastness in, in regards to his religion. And he hopes that Allah will make him firm upon that steadfastness. So he has that hope. وَقُرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ 
wa manzilatin indahu yarju wusuluhu ilayha. Or he's, he's in a situation of hope where he hopes to be brought close to his Lord. And so you'll find that all of the salikin, uh, all those who want to traverse this spiritual path, they are always in, uh, in these states of, of hope. Now imagine a person, if he, he didn't have this state of hope, or these various stations of hope, what would happen? So he's in a state of sin, and he doesn't hope, he doesn't have any aspirations or hope that Allah will forgive him. He will fall into what? Despair. He will just say, look, I'm a sinner, I'm a transgressor, there is no hope for me. No hope for me. So he becomes very pessimistic in his outlook. Why would God forgive me? Why would God guide me? Because he just looks at his sin, he has no hope in the forgiveness of his Lord. Or he looks at himself and he says, I have so many faults. So many faults. You know, I don't fulfill my obligations. I have all of these shortcomings. There's no hope for me. So this person, will he develop in life? Will he progress in his development as a good Muslim? No. Or good deeds. Imagine we belittle our good deeds so much that we, we, we consider them so insignificant that... Uh, we don't have any, any aspirations to do any more good deeds. So a person like that won't have the intention uh, to do good deeds, further good deeds in their lives. And likewise, we can apply this, this to all the other points that Ibn Qayyim, he mentions. And so therefore, we, if we look to ourselves and ask ourselves these questions, are we amongst those who hope for Allah's forgiveness? Are we amongst those who hope for Allah subhanahu wa to guide us and to keep us on the straight path? Are we amongst those who hope for Allah that, he, that Allah subhanahu wa helps to reform us and to rectify our character, our moral conduct? If we don't have these stations of hope within us, believe me, we will live a very, very pessimistic life. As, as Muslims, we will live a very, very pessimistic life. We won't progress we won't achieve much. And just putting this maybe into perspective as well. You know, if we live our, in, in, your, in your lives as, as students in university, if you don't have hope that Allah will make you successful in your studies, you will suffer. You will suffer. You'll, there'll be a times where you will become overwhelmed by work, workload and assignments and exams. And you think that, you know, there is no hope for me. Okay, so we need to be optimistic, have this optimism and be, to be optimistic in our studies as well, and not just in the you know, religious uh, sphere. Likewise, there are other concepts as we mentioned. Tawakkul, reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Reliance upon Allah. What is the essence of relying upon Allah and hoping in Him? The scholars defined tawakkul in a very simple way. It's quite in, in, the, in terms of its definition, it's very simple but quite profound. They defined it as being idharul ajizi wal i'timad al ghayr. Idhar al ajiz, when a person manifests their inability and as a result depends upon someone or something else. This is the essence of reliance, relying upon God, where you manifest your inabilities. And your weakness, your state of iftiqar, your state of poverty in front of Allah. And so as a result, you end up depending upon Him. Now, this I believe to be one of the, maybe one of the most uh, difficult stations for people to achieve, especially here in the West. Especially here in the West. The reason being is because from a very young age, I mean, we live in a secular society, so we're not brought up upon... Um, uh, the notion of depending upon one's creator. We instead we're taught to be very independent and depend upon our own uh, qualities and our own strengths. Now that's not bad in and of itself, but if it means that you don't end up depending upon Allah, then that's a huge problem. A huge problem. Because the abd or a servant, if you, if you, if you look at the concept of servitude within our religion, being a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that implies that a person must recognize his own weakness, must recognize that he's very deficient, 
must recognize that he has many faults and therefore he needs to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so you'll find that whenever, and this is an overwhelming theme, that if you look in the Quran, whenever Allah speaks about man, whenever Allah speaks about man, you'll find that Allah, he points out the faults of man more than he points to the good qualities of man. And there's a reason behind this, is because um, human beings naturally, you'll find them to, uh, you know, it's, they can become very proud and arrogant very, very quickly. That's, you know, one of the, that's one of the characteristics of man. And so he forgets his shortcomings. He, he forgets his, his, his own weaknesses. And so as a result, he doesn't feel that he needs a creator or a lord. He doesn't feel that. And so that's why Allah condemns istighna, or where a person feels self-sufficient in the Qur'an. And because it's the complete antithesis to servitude. Because servitude means you acknowledge your weakness and your need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what it means to be an abd, a slave to Allah. Where you recognize your weakness, but at the same time you recognize the greatness of Allah. You recognize that He can see to your needs. You recognize that he is the one who guides you, who supports you, who sustains you. And so this relationship is formed upon recognizing your own weakness and at the same time recognizing the greatness of Allah. So servitude becomes weak when we fail to acknowledge one of the two or both. Meaning we become weak in our servitude when we, when we fail to acknowledge our own weakness. Or when we fail to acknowledge the greatness of Allah. And living in a secular society, the way everything is set up from, from early on, from in terms of the education system to, to, every, to the environment as a whole around us, we're not really taught to uh, re recognize and acknowledge our weaknesses. We're taught more to recognize our strengths, even though these strengths really come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not really taught about the, the omnipotence of Allah, the greatness of Allah. And so we don't really feel that need to turn towards Him. This is a major obstacle in our way and it can lead to people eventually you know, leaving Islam or not feeling the need to even enter into the religion. Because they feel, why do, I, why do I need religion? Why do I need God? Why do I need? And we don't realize every second of our lives we are in need of our Creator. Even though you think that you don't need Allah, Allah is helping you and supporting you and aiding you in ways you could never imagine and fathom. So tawakkul means relying upon Allah means to manifest our weakness in front of Allah and at the same time acknowledge the greatness of Allah and how he can really see to your needs. And this is related to being optimistic because being pessimistic essentially means that you think bad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He will not help you, that He will not come to your assistance, that He will not support you and make things easy for you. But the optimist is somebody who looks to Allah and thinks good of Allah. And as a result, Allah comes to His assistance. In a beautiful hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when speaking about the concept of relying upon Allah, he says, really, really profound hadith, this hadith is an authentic hadith in a tirmidhi he said, لو أنكم كنتم توكلون على الله حق توكلي That if you were to rely upon Allah as He ought to be relied upon, لرزقتم كما يرزق الطير That Allah, He will provide for you just as Allah provides for uh, الطير, for birds. تغدو خماصا وتروح بطانا That they leave, the, the bird leaves in the morning with an empty stomach. And it comes back to its nest at the end of the day with a full stomach. Now, this is an amazing hadith, the analogy that the Prophet draws here. Look at the bird. Look at the bird. Look, look at nature around you, not just birds, but even other creatures around you. You see that they live a life of uh, activism, very active. You don't really find animals to be lethargic and lazy, become overweight, okay? You find them to be very active, they get things done, okay, always on the move, anticipating, okay, that's the nature of animals. And when they go to sleep at night, 
they are not overwhelmed with stress and worries and concern. They go to sleep in a state of you know, peace of mind, even though they have no food stored for them, a lot of animals. Okay? Imagine we went one night without any money in the bank. I mean, your students, but it's probably <laughs> what you face anyway. But, <laughs> but imagine, okay, in the future when you have children to take care of, you have no money in your bank accounts, you have no food. How would you go to sleep? In a state of anxiety and worry. But the Prophet ﷺ said, if you truly relied upon Allah as He ought to be relied upon, He would provide for you, take care of you, just as He provides for a bird. It leaves early in the morning with an empty stomach, but it comes back at the end of the day with a full stomach. Allah says, if you rely upon Allah, whoever relies upon Allah, Allah will be sufficient for him. Allah will truly be sufficient for him. Of course, this reliance upon Allah is dependent upon uh, what we say, asbab. Yeah, you, you must do certain things in order to justify that reliance. We don't believe in the concept of temenni, which is mere wishful thinking. Which by you just sitting there, you think, I'm relying upon God, He's going to come and provide for me. No, you do what you need to do, but after that, you rely upon Allah. That's the key thing. I mean, look for example in the, uh, the example of uh, Maryam. When she was about to give birth to Isa, uh, what did, and she was sitting at the trunk of the tree, what did Allah command her to do? To shake the tree. Okay, to shake the tree. Now think about this. And, and why so the dates can fall and give her some strength and, you know, some sustenance. A tree, subhanAllah, a woman who is pregnant, going through labor, how can she move a tree? Even a grown man with full strength. He can't move a date palm tree like that. You have to climb up to in order to get the dates. But what is Allah teaching Maryam? He's teaching her that you need to rely upon Allah, but at the same time, you need to do your part. You need to do your part. After you do your part, فَتَوَكَّلَ عَلَى اللَّهِ Then rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The key thing is that you manifest your need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So tawakkul, this is tawakkul, reliance uh, upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a hadith which is reported in uh, Bukhari and, and Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, as we mentioned before, يُعْجِبُنِي الْفَأْلُ الصالح الكلمة الحسنة He used to say that I like optimism and to be optimistic which is a good word. Al-Kalimatul Hasana. Al-Kalimatul Hasana. Um, what does this mean? A good word. It was a tradition of many Arabs that uh, they believed in, they were very pessimistic. That was one of the features of Jahiliya, of pre-Islamic ignorance, uh, that of pessimism. And they have a lot of superstitious practices from amongst them like Tiyara where they would see, they would look at the, the, the flight of birds, they would go to the left and that's an indication that, you know, this is like a bad omen, something bad will happen, etc. And it, a lot of these bad omens even exist in, in our cultures, unfortunately. Okay, a lot of our cultures. I know in the Bengali culture, we find there's many strange omens. Like if you step over somebody's foot, that means they won't grow anymore. You know, we, there's many omens like that. Um, and these are all pure polytheistic and, you know, in omens which have no basis whatsoever. Um, and so the Arabs, they, they, you know, to the extent, and listen to this, this is very strange. They used to name their children with bad names. Okay, with bad names. For example, they'll call their children Harb, war, or Huzn, sadness. Now, why would they do that? And this just shows you the state of the Arabs before Islam came. As you know, before the Prophet ﷺ came with his message, there were so many wars that would take place amongst the various different Arab tribes over the most ridiculous of affairs. And people would take you know, women and children as prisoners of war. Okay? But if they found out that the names of these children had a bad meaning, they wouldn't take them as prisoners of war. Okay? So if someone's name was Huzn, Sadness, for example. 
they was like, no, 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 he, that's a bad omen. He would just bring sadness to us. Or if they took someone as, whose name was Harb, war, he's just going to bring us more war and fighting. So they would name their children with these names. Can you believe it? Subhanallah. Very, very strange. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would really condemn this practice. And in a hadith, it mentions how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he came across a man called Hazm, sadness. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Masmuka, what's your name? He said, Hazm. So he said, La, Bal Anta Sahlun. He said, No, no, your name is Sahal, which means easygoing. You know, he used to like names like that. You know, names that give, give you know, give good, good vibes and good meanings. So I say, your name is Sahal. And he said, لا, ما أنا بمغير اسما سماني أبي. That no, I'm not going to change my name. My father named me this, so I'm going to keep it. And so he said, and so, uh, and, and so the, the one who narrated the hadith, he said, فَمَا زَالَتْ فِيْنَا الْحُزُونَ بَعْدُ SubhanAllah. He said, we noticed that this person, he, uh, he had a sad life. You know, for, after that, he kept on having... And that's why uh, some scholars were, even to the extent that they said that um, a person's name influences uh, their behavior. The meaning of the name influences their behavior. So if you have a good, righteous name, you're reminded of righteousness. You're reminded of goodness. As opposed to having a name that has many negative connotations attached to it. Okay, and this has become a habit that you'll find that, um, you know, among some cultures, I know in the Arab culture, for example, they have uh, some names which are very questionable, like Fatana. Uh, Fatana is a, is a common, I don't know if anyone here is called Fatana, but Fatana means someone who is like, a, uh, and is so attractive that it causes fitna. <laughs> yeah? So... <laughs> So, you know, negative meanings like that. But, but you, I think you, you, you understand uh, my point. Um, and likewise, when during the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah in the sixth year after Hijrah, um, Suhail ibn Amr, who was uh, from, from the side of the Mushrikeen, from the polytheists, when he came as a delegation from the Quraysh, his name was Sahal ibn Amr. Uh, sorry, Suhail ibn Amr. And Suhail is the diminutive form of Sahal. So Suhail means someone who is, uh, you know, again, easygoing and etc. So when he came, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Sahula lakum min amrikum, meaning your affair is one of ease. This is, he's talking to a, a, a polytheist here. But he was happy when, when this man came because Suhail has a good meaning. Then perhaps he will have some, you know, we will, this uh, treaty that we will have, it might have some, you know, positive, a positive end to it. And likewise, when he would uh, visit, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he used to visit the sick, what did he used to say? He would say, la ba's, tuhurun insha'Allah. He said, not to worry. This is a means of purification for you. A means of purification. So despite going through all that hardship that this person, he's commonly suffering all that pain and hardship. And uh, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's just looking at it with optimism. And he said, look, okay, you're suffering pain, but yes, this is a means for your sins to be purified. Allah is elevating your ranks if you have the right intention, if you are patient. And anticipate that reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he would say this, and that's why we say it's recommended for a person when they see someone who is sick to say these words. La ba's tahuran insha'Allah, like no problem. This is the means of purification for you. For you. But what did the man say? He said, Kalla, no. Hummatun tafur. This is just, you know, I'm suffering from a fever which is just beyond, uh, you know, I, I can't bear this fever. Ala shaykhin kabir. I'm an old man. Tuziruhu al qubur. This sickness is going to send me to my grave. And look at the response of the Prophet. What did he say? He said, Idan fana'am. If that's your attitude, that's how it's going to be. A few days passed and he died. Okay, a few days down. And, and so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was a, you know, he was trying to be optimistic with this man, but this man refused. His mind was just focused on um, the, the hardship and the tribulation. And he wasn't focused on the one who placed the tribulation there in the first place. And that's an important rule, by the way, an important principle. Whatever hardship you go through in life, 
there are two things here. There is a hardship itself, which we call the bala, but there's also the mubtali, the one who places the, the tribulation there, who is Allah. And Allah, he never allows anything which is pure evil, in essence, to take place. There is whatever Allah decrees, there's some wisdom to it, whether we recognize that or not. The problem with most people, that when they go through trials and tribulations, they only see the trial. They don't see the one who placed the child there. And so their minds become overwhelmed by the tribulation. But if your mind actually focused on the one who placed the child there, you would look at things in a very, very different way. That's why the scholars have mentioned the story of a man who, a righteous scholar, who once went to a tyrant. And uh, this tyrant, so he, he went to, to forbid the evil, to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. And so as a result, this tyrant ruler uh, executed him in the most horrific way. You know, he cut off his hands and his legs and he just threw him into the marketplace for, for him to die in that way. The so people gathered around him and they, they were looking at him and thinking, this poor man, you know, and imagine what would be on your mind if, if, if you were in that position. So they went and they all gathered around him and they found him smiling. Smiling, you know. He's just been executed. He's dying. He's dying in a slow, painful death. He's going to leave his family behind, and his, you know, his wife and children, etc. But he's smiling. So people asked him, what, what, what makes you smile? So he said, He said, look, this is the gentleness that Allah has with regards to those who harmed the awliya of Allah, the friends of Allah. Meaning, he's, he's, he's referring to, he's thinking about this tyrant ruler. He sees that this tyrant ruler has oppressed, he's com committed so much corruption upon the earth, he's sp spilling blood and what have you. Yet Allah is giving him respite, is giving him a chance to turn back. He hasn't just suddenly seized him and punished him, like he did with many of the oppressors of the past. He's giving him a chance to turn back. So he said, هَذَا حِلْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَى مَنْ آذَى أَوْلِيَاءَ اللَّهِ This is the gentleness of Allah to the one who has harmed the friends of Allah. فَمَا حِلْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَى مَنْ أُوذِيَ فِي اللَّهِ So then what would be the gentleness and the kindness of Allah to the one who has harmed in his way? He's referring to himself. So he's anticipating that. So notice here that, but look at his psyche here. What's he focused on? His mind is focused on the one who placed the trial there in the first place and not on the tribulation itself. That's what leads to optimism and to be optimistic. It leads to that. And it completely shuts the door and locks the door to pessimism because you just see the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see the possibility of earning reward, of achieving great things. Likewise, as we mentioned towards the beginning of, 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 the, of the lecture, there is another concept known as husn of one, or thinking good of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is something which is commanded within our religion. There is su of one, there is having bad and suspicious thoughts, which is haram or disliked, depending on the circumstance. So even amongst human beings, it's forbidden for us to have bad and suspicious thoughts about other human beings. We shouldn't think bad of people. We should always think the best of other people. So that's haram and, and dislike with regards to human beings. It's also haram with regards to Allah. It's also haram with regards to Allah. It's haram to think bad of Allah, to have negative thoughts about Allah. In fact, you're only meant to have positive thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why in a hadith, in a hadith Qudsi, Allah, he says, that ana inda dhanni abdi bi that i am as my servant expects me to be very powerful hadith tradition i am as my servant expects me to be in dhanna bi khayran falahu so if he thinks good of me then that's for him meaning he will face the positive consequences of that wa in dhanna bi sharran falahu and if he thinks evil of me then he will, or thinks bad of me, then he will see the consequences of that. 
He will, and even amongst human beings, think about it, amongst our dealings, if people always think bad of you, if people always think bad of you, and always think about the negative things you do, how do you treat them? Okay, how do you treat such a person? Okay, you don't really want to interact with them that much. You don't really want to give them the best treatment. Okay, but if people always come to you thinking about your, you know, looking at your positive qualities, how do you respond? You try to respond in the best manner possible. So think good of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think good of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And be optimistic with regards to what Allah can give you. And that's why the Prophet used to say, Ud'u Allah wa antum muqinuna bil ijaba. That when you call upon Allah, call upon Allah whilst you are in a state of certainty. Whilst in a state of certainty. That you are certain that Allah will respond to your supplications. Now people will say, well, I call upon Allah, but I don't see anything. I don't see that He is responding to my supplications. And that's where we have to realize that Allah responds to our supplications in various different ways. He might not necessarily give the thing that you want. He might give something else which is actually better for you. You might ask for something in particular, but Allah realizes that that's not actually good for you, so He gives you something else in return. But you don't see that, because you're not, you haven't been asking for that. Or perhaps that Allah, He will delay giving that thing to you because he wants you to keep on turning to him and calling upon him. Or perhaps that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will turn away from you the equivalent in terms of evil and harm. Or perhaps Allah will give you something better in the, in the afterlife. Okay, so what, whatever you do, when, as if you call upon Allah with certainty, he will respond to you. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ Allah says, and if my servants ask you concerning me, then tell them I am close. Tell them I am close. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي إِذَا دَعَان That I respond to the caller when he calls upon me. No ifs and buts. If you call upon him with sincerity, from the bottom of your heart, whilst avoiding obviously the impediments and what have you, things that can block your supplication, and there are a number of things, but... As long as you're you know, doing what's generally required from you, have certainty that Allah will respond to your supplications. We say this with our tongues, but really do we believe it in our hearts? That's, that's, that's the issue. I believe that if we all believed from the bottom of our hearts that Allah does respond to our supplications in one way or another, we would continuously be calling upon Him. But again, that goes back to... Um, you know, on the condition that you have this, that this need for Allah. If you don't feel that you have a need for Allah, you won't even really be calling upon Him. And that's why, really, I mean, I've said this for, for, for many years now, that if you really want to look at the, the state of your relationship with Allah, then look at the state of your dua, look at the state of your supplications. If you find that you're, not, you're somebody who doesn't really supplicate to Allah, then that really indicates that you don't really have this need for Allah. And if you don't really have a need for Allah, then you're not really an abd, you know, a servant to Allah, a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he also said, لا يموتن أحدكم إلا وهو يحسن ظن بالله That none of you should die unless, um, none of you should die unless you have, unless he has good thoughts about Allah. Unless he has good thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, teaching us the importance of thinking good of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that he will come to your uh, assistance. Now, if we look also um, to the examples of other righteous people that came before us, other prophets and other righteous people, we will find that in their stories we find a lot of uh, optimism and, and, and having this, uh, uh, having, uh, being optimistic in their approach to life. Look for example in the story of Musa alayhi salam. When Musa alayhi salam was being chased by the army of Fir'aun and he reached to, to, the, to the sea, the companions of Musa, they said, Inna, inna la mudarakun. That that's it, we've been caught now. They've caught up with us, there is no hope for us. How did Musa alayhi salam respond? Qala kalla. He said, no. Inna ma'ya rabbi sayahdeen. With me is my Lord and he will guide me. So imagine at that moment, you know, you come to the sea. Musa alayhi salam, he's, he hasn't been told yet that the sea is going to be parted, that Allah is going to split the sea. He hasn't been told that. 
He just sees water in front of him. Despite, and, and he can see the army behind him. This would be a moment of desperation for most people. But look at the conviction that he had. No. With me is my Lord. He will guide me. Look at the example of the Prophet وسلم, when he was migrating to Medina and he was being chased by the polytheists. When he reached the cave and he was with Abu Bakr and they hid in that cave. And the, the mushrikeen was so close. Abu Bakr became so worried. He said, Oh Messenger of Allah, if they look down, they will see our feet. That's how close they were. And so the Prophet said, he smiled. He smiled in the face of Abu Bakr, uh, to Abu Bakr and he says, Ma dhannuka? What do you think of two people who Allah is afraid amongst them? Allah is afraid amongst them. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in Surah Al Tawbah. إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعْنَا And remember when your companions, he said to him, uh, لَا تَحْزَنْ Don't be sad, don't be afraid, don't have this grief and anxiety. إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعْنَا Indeed Allah is with us. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَيْهِ And so Allah sent down his tranquility upon him, meaning upon Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه. So where did this tranquility come from? It came from Allah. Why did it come? Why did it, why did it descend upon the heart of Abu Bakr? Because the Prophet nurtured him upon realizing that Allah is with us. That Allah is with them. And so when you reach that level of awareness of the closeness of Allah, tranquility naturally descends upon the person's heart. So any tribulation you face in life, any tribulation you face in life, you realize Allah is there. And this reminds you of a story Imam al Dhahabi he mentions in his huge work of biographies of, of the great people of this Ummah. Abu Qilaba, in the story of Abu Qilaba, he mentions there was a man by the name of Muhammad Abu Abdullah. And this man, he, he narrates the story how he went into the desert and he was on a long journey. And in the distance, he saw there was a very old tent. So he thought he would go to this tent, maybe, you know, refresh, refresh and, and, you know, take take some food and rest and what have you. So he enters into the tent and he sees an old man. This old man, he's blind. His hands were cut off because he suffered from some, some disease which meant that he had to cut off his hands. He was paralyzed as well. So imagine that, he's blind, he's paralyzed and he has no hands. So he enters into the tent and the only thing he can hear from this man, what does he say? He said, All praises due to Allah, who has preferred me to many of his other servants. He's preferred me. And so this man is thinking, he's entering the den. He sees this man paralyzed, blind, he has no hands, and he hears this man saying, All praises due to Allah, who has preferred me over many of his creation. He couldn't understand it. He thought, he thought to him, if I was in that position, I wouldn't be thinking like that. And so he went up to him and he says, you know, he greets him and introduces himself. But he said, why were you saying this? Why are you saying this? Why do you keep repeating this? Why do you keep repeating this? So he said to him, look, aren't there many people out there that can't hear? Which said, there are many people out there that can't hear. Many deaf people. He said, Allah has given me the ability to hear. Alhamdulillah. Allah has preferred me over those people. And then he said, aren't there many people out there, many people who are insane, have no intellect, they cannot think right? He said, there are many people out there like that. He said, Allah has preferred me over them. And he said, aren't there many people who worship stones and rocks and you know, cows and what have you, idols? And he says, many people that do that. And he said, look, Allah has preferred me over these people. And so whatever he looked at, subhanAllah, he just, he just thought, despite the hardship he was going through, he just saw the grace of Allah. He just saw the grace of Allah and the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he was living a life of internal joy. He was really actually in a state of bliss, internal bliss. And, and so they began to discuss and, and talk. And so the man, he said, Subhanallah, everyone, you see, you don't see anyone around me because my, my family members, they've all died, essentially. And, 
But there is one slight problem. I have a young son who's, who has been missing since last night. And he's the one who brings me food and water and what have you. Please can you help me to find him? So he went out and searched for him. And he came across this small like a hill or a mountain. And he saw a lot of like vultures and birds in that area. So he thought, okay, when you see a lot of vultures like that, that's usually a sign of what? Uh, someone's dead or etc. So he goes and he finds the body of a young boy, which is obviously, which he understood to be the son of this poor blind man. So he thought, subhanAllah, what am I going to do? What am I going to say to him? So when he was walking back to the tent, he starts to think about the examples he can use in the Quran maybe that can maybe give him some relief and hope. And so he thought of the story of Ayyub alayhi salam. And as you know, Ayyub job, he was afflicted with a number of tribulations. You know, he lost his family, skin disease and you know, leprosy and what have you. He, a lot of calamities and hardship in life. So he thought he would give him ease by reminding him about this story. So he, when he entered into the tent, he said, um, you know, I have some news to tell you. But first, I tell you the news, answer some questions. He said, who do you think has been tested more in life? <coughs> you or Ayyub alayhi salam? He said, clearly Ayyub alayhi salam, he was tested far more than, uh, than I have been tested. And then he mentioned more aspects of the story of Ayyub. And then after that, then he said, look, I'm going to tell you now that your son has passed away or he, he was killed or he was attacked, etc. He naturally, he broke down. He fell into tears and... You know, it was said that in the story, later on in the story, that after a few days he, he passed away as well, subhanAllah. But then the, the one who narrated the story, he said that night he had a dream. And he saw this man, this poor man. He had hands, he's wearing beautiful garments, very happy, looked young and energetic. And so he said, what did Allah do with you? What happened to you? He said, Allah forgave me all of my sins. And how? How was it said to you? He said, it was said to me, Salamun alaykum bima sabartum fani'ma uqubat dar. This is an ayah in the Quran. Salamun alaykum bima sabartum. Like, peace be upon you. Due to the patience that you had, fani'ma uqubat dar. And what a beautiful abode this is for those who were patient. So we can see here, and there are many other examples we can give from the stories of the righteous, how whenever they would suffer tribulations or hardship, they would be very optimistic. And they would look at the brighter side of things. That's why one of the scholars, he said that whenever I am afflicted with a calamity or trial and tribulation, I praise Allah. I thank Allah. Why? Because he said, number one, I thank Allah for not giving me a greater tribulation. I thank Allah for not giving me a greater tribulation. So do you look, to, look to your own lives, for example. Look at the hardships that you suffer from. Some, some of the things that you've really found difficult to deal with. Some of those issues. And then just compare that to what other people suffer. And see, and really ask yourselves, do you have the right to, to complain about what you're suffering from? When there are people out there that are suffering far greater tribulations and trials and tribulations. So I say, Alhamdulillah. All praises due to Allah for that. Secondly, he says, I praise Allah for not allowing this tribulation to affect my religion. Sometimes people suffer from such great tribulations that it makes them doubt their own faith. Okay? That they cannot understand maybe some of the decrees of Allah. And so as a result, they doubt their own faith. But people who suffer trials and tribulations, but they still can retain their faith. This is a reason to thank Allah. Thirdly, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to... Uh, who has allowed me to be patient. So if you found that you're patient upon dealing with tribulations, that's a reason to be grateful to Allah. And in a hadith, the Prophet wasallam he said, uh, there is no greater gift that a person can receive than the gift of patience. There is no greater blessing that a person, or gift that a person can receive from Allah than the gift of patience. So if you can be patient during, during trials and tribulations, that's a reason to be grateful to Allah. The fourth reason why I thank Allah, he says, I thank Allah because he allows me to earn the reward of being patient. Because for whenever you are patient and or you restrain yourselves from complaining about Allah or his decrees, 
or doing something which is haram or impermissible, when you restrain yourselves from doing that, that's an opportunity to accumulate reward and earn reward. So you can see, whatever you go through in life, there is a reason to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, other examples we can give. Uh, look at the story of uh, the mother of Ismail, Hajar. When, as we know, when Ibrahim, he took Ismail and Hajar, and when he was in Mecca, and he told Hajar to stay there whilst he had to go to his Lord. And they're in barren, dry and barren land. There's no water, there's no food. And all of a sudden, imagine you're a, you're a, you're a woman with your child and a husband just suddenly leaves you. Suddenly just gets up and leaves you. And so, when Ibrahim, he tells Hajar that I have to go, my Lord is calling me. How did she respond? She said, Allahu amaraka bihada. Has Allah commanded you to do this? Qala na'am. He said, yes. And then she replied, Ithan la yudayyuna. Then if that's the case, then Allah, he will not abandon us. Allah will not abandon us. And so we know the story of where she ran between the two mountains of Safa and Marwa. And that's where the well of Zamzam, it came. And up until today, we drink from this well of Zamzam in Mecca. Optimism again. Likewise, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Khadija radiyallahu anha. When the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam first came to her, uh, when after receiving revelation for the first time, he was scared and afraid. When he said, "Zamiluni, zamiluni, cover me, cover me, wrap me up in something," he was very afraid. When he met Jibril alaihi wasallam for the first time, so he said, "I fear for myself," and she said, "No, kalla." Wallahi ma yukhzik Allahu abada. Allah will never, you know, disgrace you. Allah will never disgrace you. Inna kala tasilur rahim. Why? Because you do these great things. You connect the ties of kinship. Wa tahmilul kal. You take care of the affairs of the poor and the needy. You look after them. Wa taksibul ma'doom. And you give sustenance to those who have nothing. Wa taqrid dayf. And you take care of your guests. Wa ta'inu ala nawa'ib al haqq. And so on and so on. She mentioned the good qualities of the Prophet ﷺ. Thinking about the good qualities that he had. Thinking that Allah will never treat the Prophet ﷺ in this manner. Can you imagine this happened to one of us today? We'll probably call the doctors and think that this, our husband is going insane or something. You know? No, but she looked to the positive side of things. And she realized that this man, no, he has great and amazing qualities. It's not possible that Allah can treat him in that manner. And so many other examples we can give. And look in the example, the beautiful example in, uh, in a lengthy tradition where the Prophet ﷺ, um, uh, uh, when Aisha radiallahu an, again the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, she asked the Prophet ﷺ a question and she said, um, was there a day that was more difficult for you than the, the, than the day of the battle of Uhud? And he replied by saying, لَقَدْ لَقِيتُ مِنْ قَوْمِكِ I have you know, met many trials and tribulations and hardship in my life. But the greatest thing that I, or the greatest tribulation that I faced was the day of Aqaba. When I went to, um, uh, uh, when I went to Ibn Abdi Layali, Ibn Kulal, and I essentially offered my, uh, Islam to him to accept the religion. And so obviously he rejected me. And as a result, we know the story. When he was thrown out of Ta'if and children chased him with stones until his blessed feet, sallallahu alayhi wa was covered in blood, his own blood. So he said, فَانْطَلَقْتُ وَأَنَا مَهْمُومٌ That I left and I was really sad. And then I suddenly looked above me and I could see a cloud. That wherever I walked, it was he was essentially walking along with me. And then that's behold, that's where I saw Jibreel alayhi salam. And he said, Jibreel, Inna Allah Azza wa Jal qada sami'a qawla qawmik. That indeed Allah has heard and has seen what the people have done to you. وَقَدْ بَعَثَ إِلَيْكَ مَلَكَ الْجِبَالِ And Allah has sent the angel of, mount, of the mountains. لِتَأْمَرُهُ بِمَا شِئْتَ you can do in order for you you can command him to do whatever you want 
uh, for, you can command him to do whatever you want. So he's an angel of mountains. So if he wants, he can completely, this angel can destroy this town with, you know, between these mountains. So the angel of the Jibal, the angel of the, uh, the, the mountains, he came, gave salam to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And again, he mentioned what Jibreel mentioned, that Allah has heard what the people have done and seen what the people have done to you. What do you command me to do? Whatever you command me to do, I will do it. If you want me to crush these people between these two mountains, I will do it. The Prophet ﷺ said no. He said no. Bal arju, but rather I hope. That's the important word. I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make from their offspring those who will worship Allah alone and not associate any partners with Allah. And it just so happened that the people from this tribe ended up being from the most righteous of the, of the, uh, of the Muslims in the Arabian Peninsula. So he had hope. He wasn't full of vengeance. And, you know, No, he hoped. And he always uh, looked out for the goodness in people rather than looking out for the negative qualities. Again, optimistic. I have to really uh, conclude, but uh, spoken long enough here, but uh, just a few points before we end. Um, from the fawaid or the benefits of, of being optimistic is that it brings a sense of internal uh, tranquility and peace of mind. We saw the example of Abu Bakr when he was in the cave with the Prophet wasallam, and how Allah, he, he made that tranquility descend upon him. We saw the example of that righteous man who approached that tyrant, that even in a moment of death, and he was dying a slow and painful death, he had peace and tranquility in his heart. He was optimistic. We see the example of Hajar, the wife of Ibrahim, that even though she was alone by herself with her child in the desert, inna Allah la yudayyuna, that Allah will never forsake, forsake us and leave us and abandon us. We can see that inner peace and that sense of tranquility. So the, the lesson that we take from this, brothers and sisters, is that whenever we go through trials and tribulations and hardships and we are you know, afflicted with stress and grief and pressure, use it as an opportunity to find peace. Use it as an opportunity to find peace. As for Umar ibn Khattab, he said a beautiful saying. He said, we found that the best days of our lives were the days of patience. Ayyamu sabr. And when do you need patience? When you go through trials and tribulations. When you go through hardships. So we found the greatest days of our lives to be those days. Because it brings you that much closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you view everything in, in, uh, in an optimistic uh, way. And on that note, inshallah, we will... Uh, We'll stop on that point, inshallah. Uh, maybe if you want to open the floor for question and answers, up to you, inshallah. Uh, Shukrakallah khair. So um, I'm a bit wary of the time, so we won't take too many questions. So if there's uh, anyone who's got any questions, um, raise your hand, inshallah. Yep. Yeah, so the sister is asking, um, you know, can a person essentially be so, like, uh, find it so correctly, like, so overwhelmed with sins that they think that there is no hope for them? Or that they don't think they're worthy of. They don't think that they're worthy. Clearly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many places, you know, stresses that He forgives all sins. Allah, He forgives all sins. And, he, and Allah says, you know, say to those who have wronged themselves. Never despair from the mercy of Allah. Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jamia. Allah he forgives all sins. All sins. All sins. So no matter what you commit, there is a chance for you to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in a beautiful story, the, the story of a man uh, who, who killed 99 men. Who killed 99 Imagine, you know, the crime of, of, of killing someone. A huge crime within our religion. Huge crime. This man, he killed 99 people. And after killing 99 people, he 
he had so much regret that he wanted to turn back to Allah. And so he went to uh, in search of maybe some sort of guidance, some sort of teaching, some religious practices that could help him maybe turn back to Allah. So someone guided him to this monk, this worshipper, and said, go to him, he will be able to help you out. And so he went to him and he said, look, I've killed 99 people, is there any repentance for me? He simply said, there's no, <laughs> there's no repentance for you. You've killed 99 people, there's no hope. So what did he end up doing? He became so angry and frustrated, he killed him as well. A hundred people now. So then he went again in search of someone who could maybe give him some knowledge and some guidance. But this time he was pointed to a scholar rather than just a worshipper. And the scholar said, yes, there is a way out for you. Go to this place where you will find these righteous people, spend your time with them, stay away from evil and worship Allah. And so he, on, his, on, the, way to that journey, on the way to that destination, he died. He died. And then the angels came to take his soul. And as you know, there are two types of angels, the angels of mercy and the angels of punishment. So he was obviously a sinner, who killed a hundred people, yet he had the intention in his heart to do something good. So as a result, the angels came down and they began to dispute amongst themselves who should take his soul. The angels of mercy or the angels of punishment. So obviously the angels of punishment, they have a good reason to take his soul. A good reason to take his soul because he killed a hundred people. But the angel of mercy said, no, look, you know, he intended to turn back to Allah and to repent to him. And so whilst they were um, uh, disputing, um, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent another angel to resolve the dispute. And so he said that the angel said that whatever land he is closer to, then that angel will take his soul. Meaning, so if he's closer to the land of the righteous people, then he, he can be taken by the angel of mercy. But if he's closer to the land of the sinners, then or where he committed those crimes, then the angel of punishment can take his soul. But in another hadith, it mentions how Allah made his body move closer to the, to the land of where those worshippers were. And so the angel of mercy took his body, took, took, took his soul. So that shows you the, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he, if you turn back to him and sincere, no matter what sins you commit, there is a way out. And never despair. In fact, despairing from the mercy of Allah is considered to be a sin in and of itself. I hope that answers the question. Uh, um, this will be the last question. Um, <coughs> so you mentioned one way of uh, uh, you, you talked about looking at the, 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 the good things that Allah has given to some people yeah. to, to you and comparing with the punishments that he or, or the trials he could have given, given to other people. How do you balance that with not wanting to become arrogant and thinking, oh, well, Allah has favoured me with this yeah. and allowing that to progress into not being humble. Anymore. Yeah, it's a very good question. So the brother, he asked that um, in, in the talk we mentioned how we're meant to look to the, the favours of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his bounties, then how do we understand that in light of the prohibition of, of being arrogant and thinking that you know, you're know you actually a, a righteous person, uh, etc. Um, when viewing the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, we should look at it from a perspective of humility. We look at it from the perspective of humility. We don't um, look at the favors of Allah to think that, look, we deserve these blessings. That leads to pride and arrogance. Like, oh, I, because I'm righteous, Allah has given me this. But no, look at it from a different perspective. Look at it from the perspective of humility that, look, it's only through the grace of Allah. Not because I really deserve it, but this is the grace of Allah. The grace of Allah and He has helped me, He has given me all of these blessings even though I do not really deserve it. And if you look at it from that perspective, it, looking at the blessings of Allah only increases you in humility. Only increases you in humility. Because when you see your own faults, when you see your own faults, and at the same time see all of these blessings of Allah, you think, Subhana, how, how do I deserve this? How do I deserve it? And that's why Ibn Qayyim he said in a very profound statement, that if Allah wishes good for a person, um, he opens up the door to remorse and being able to acknowledge one's own weakness and deficiencies. That's if Allah wants good for you. And so you're constantly, all you see is just you know, your own weaknesses and your own sins. Even though you acknowledge the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And that's why if, we, if you look, for example, the Ashara Mubashara, the ten companions that were promised paradise, they were told by the Prophet that you will enter into paradise. You will never enter into the hellfire. Yet despite that, they looked at their own weaknesses. They were not full of pride and arrogance. They kept on looking at their own weaknesses and they were afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so I think that's the key thing. As long as you can acknowledge, number one, that the blessings you receive are not because essentially you deserve them, but this is just grace from Allah. And secondly, you have to keep being able to acknowledge and see and witness your own uh, weaknesses. And, and deficiencies. And likewise, the Shaykh to the Ibn Qayyim said, if Allah wishes bad for a person, uh, he closes that door of remorse and the ability to see one's own deficiencies and weaknesses. So if you're somebody who cannot see your own weaknesses and faults, as a Muslim, as a human being, whatever, then that's a sign that Allah doesn't want good for you. Because you won't turn to him. Instead, you'll just look at yourself with, with pride and arrogance and self-sufficiency, but you know what? I don't need Allah. I don't need God. And when a person reaches that level, that's essentially the level of, of shaitan because he felt that he was so arrogant that he had that much arrogance and pride that he felt, I'm better than, than Adam alayhi salam. You know, uh, and he just looked at himself with, with positive, you know, so-called positive things that he 